Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Hi, podcast listeners. I just wanted to wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving and happy Thanksgiving week. I hope you're catching up on all the back episodes that you may have missed now that you're driving all over or flying or doing whatever. And I just wanted to say How truly, truly, truly thankful I am for all of you, for all of you tuning in regularly, listening to these episodes. I'm thankful for all the authors who have come on as guests and who continue to listen and just everybody who has made this podcast really take off and enabled me to do things like start a publishing company and open a bookstore and do all the things I'm doing. Um, I don't know. I, Without all of you listening and supporting the show, None of this would be possible. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a great Thanksgiving. Teresa Brown is the author of Healing, When a Nurse Becomes a Patient. She is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Shift, and has been a contributor to the New York Times. Her writing appears on CNN.com and in the American Journal of Nursing, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. She has been a guest on MSNBC Live and NPR's Fresh Air. Her first book was Critical Care, and during what she calls her past life, she received a PhD in English from the University of Chicago. She lectures nationally and internationally on issues related to nursing, healthcare, and the end of life. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to talk about healing when a nurse becomes a patient. You are welcome. Thanks for having me. And I I love the title. I I remember those days. (laughs) Oh, I thought you meant your title. I was like, yeah, it's really good. (laughs) No, no, mom's. You like my title. Thank you. Mom, (laughs) yes, yes. (laughs) Well, I also like your title. So there we go. Would you mind telling listeners what your book is about? I would not mind at all. So five years ago now, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, very small tumor, slow growing, but nonetheless terrifying. And my background is I'm an oncology nurse. Well, my my real background is I have a PhD in English. I taught English in college, had kids, had a life change, went back to school, became a nurse, worked in oncology and in hospice. So I knew how bad cancer can be in a very visceral, detailed way. But I think even if you don't have that, diagnosis of cancer is always terrifying. So I was terrified and went through treatment and was surprised to experience all these ways that the healthcare system is just completely lacking in compassion toward people. I mean, clinically, I got great care, but there were so many glitches and things that happened that were scary and hurtful and made me feel abandoned. And what that did was made me start thinking about my work as a nurse. And I knew there were glitches. I mean, you'd have to be living under a rock not to know there are problems in our healthcare system. But I thought, well, I and the people I work with, we care so much. We make up for anything that goes wrong, right? We make the difference. And the care we give is great and we save people's lives. And as a patient, I just saw, no, it's not like that. There's a huge gap between what patients need in terms of having their humanity recognized and what they get. And so the book alternates between me learning I have cancer, getting treatment for cancer, managing that and looking back on my time as a nurse. This is a a good tip for moms who don't have time to read. My son, who's 26 now, I'm bad at remembering ages, 
read the book and he said, you know, that back and forth, I thought it was annoying. And then I realized it was your mindset. So that's another tip. Like, yes, that's actually, I appreciate his honesty. He said in a very loving way. And that's a tip for this alternating I was doing in my own mind between, oh my God, now I realize, wow, we can't make up for that. You know, we, we can't make up for the person who came in to get chemo and it was really, really, really delayed or, or, or just all the things that are going on with people. And so this is a very long answer, I realize, but basically I'm, what it comes down to is having cancer is terrifying. You know, some of that is because we're not really told as I was not, this is very treatable. It's small. We can handle it. We know how to take care of this. And some of it is reality that people every year die of cancer. It's one of the leading causes of death in the U.S. And our healthcare system just is not there to deal with that terror, anxiety, worry. It's much more like an assembly line. And we're people, not widgets or TVs or cars. And so we need better. So I I wrote the book in a hope for better. Wow. Well, what you did so well is even though that was a fabulous summary in the book, you show us with so many examples, all the flaws and weaknesses and, and just little moments where compassion on the part of a nurse or a healthcare worker of some type would have made like the biggest difference in the world to you, particularly when you die, when you talked about your whole diagnosis and you take us through all the steps of that. And there was this one particular nurse, well, the one nurse who left early and then the other yeah. nurse who was just like, well, we'll probably, we probably can't get to it, give you your results until Monday. And you're like, how can I just spend a weekend waiting? And you're like, so you're telling me that the results will be there, but they're going to be on your desk and you won't have time to call. And you're, and she's like, well, I leave at three. And you're like, what? And then she yes. never called you and she never called you. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Insane. Insane. How do you like make sense of that? I mean, it's, it's what, how do you, what do you make of that? Especially because you're such a compassionate nurse yourself. Like, what do you, what can we do? You, I mean, I know at some points you said it's not the fault of the individual people. It's the structure of the system and everything, but how do you take out the compassion of someone or the empathy even just to say like, gosh, I wouldn't want to wait all weekend long either. Right. And right. And you get right down to it. It is individual failure. I mean, it, it, it is on that nurse to just say, well, I leave at four. I mean, that's not an answer. It, the buck, If the buck stops with you, then you need to do something different. You can't just say, well, I'll leave. That's it. You're going to be hanging. So, so yeah, I try to be careful to say it's the system, but also that was part of what was so painful for me in my own treatment is realizing oh, I had moments like this. It, it, not like that. I mean, I was never like that. That, that. I find that particularly bad. But, you know, I certainly had moments like that. Yeah, so I'm going to give what may seem like a little bit of an indirect answer. But when I, I talk in the book about radiation oncology, which people don't usually think of as being warm and fuzzy, right? It's a sort of like most creepy aspect of your treatment. But where I went for radiation oncology... It was so great. And it wasn't like they had a patient compassion initiative or, you know, banners up saying, you're important. It it just was obvious in everything that they did. So they had a Keurig machine, which I, I know COVID has made that complicated. This is before the pandemic. Just a simple thing like that. They had a Keurig machine. Um, that was well stocked and they pointed it out to me. You were supposed to come in and check in by putting your index finger on this thing that sometimes works, sometimes didn't, and use the computer. And a couple of times I forgot, and the secretary just said, Oh, I'll just check you in here, it's fine. Instead of saying, use the computer, which has happened to me more than once. And then I didn't like having to wait in the waiting room with the television on. I don't know why. Let's make a deal before radiation just made me incredibly (laughs) anxious. I don't know why. (laughs) So I said, can we turn the TV off? And they said, well, we'll talk about it. And they said, you know, no, we can't because some people like it, but you could sit in the hallway. So this was five days a week, four weeks. 
sat out in the hallway, a tech came out and got me, never said, oh, you know, you're really making me work extra here. Or I mean, people would not believe the things that get said to you. Like, I'm not exaggerating. Like that particular thing didn't get said to me, but I know that kind of thing has been said to other patients. They were just so wonderful and lovely. And one of the techs, they were all in their 20s. And anyone who knocks millennials, I feel like you just haven't spent time with people. I just want to put that out there. These were amazing. And one of them said, you know, we know you don't want to be here. So we have to be extra nice. It's really that simple. And obviously somebody in that office had really focused on that, right? It was important to them to make patients comfortable. And I think that is a lot of what it takes. And I I use that example to say, you know, this was not anything elaborate. It was not complicated. It was just basic civility, politeness, and seeing me as a human being. That said, I know that when you work in a system where you're constantly being evaluated on your output and did you fill out this form right? And hey, you got this detail on this, you know, fifth computer sheet you were supposed to do wrong. That is going to like beat the compassion out of you, right? And so it really does have to start at the top, but it doesn't have to be complicated but it has to be a recognition that the people doing the work are also human beings and that's going to enable them to treat patients like human beings. And we have gotten so far away from that by allowing to develop this healthcare system that's so focused on money. Are you able to pay? How can we maximize revenue? You know, discrimination, if you look at the rates of cancer death among African Americans are much higher than among white Americans. You know, the people who get denied care just because they don't have the money to afford it, you know, on and on and on and on. All the stuff we we read about during COVID and that and that most people are very aware of. But this is how it plays out. It plays out and this kind of casual cruelty, I, I think is not too harsh a word to use. And Then what I try to also show in the book through data and research is that compassion really does help people heal. This is not just about, oh, no one made me feel like a human being. You know, it's much deeper than that. And it, it really makes a difference in terms of how well you do, whether you're willing to listen to what's being said to you, you know, on and on and on and on. I mean, it just has a cascade effect that can either be positive or negative. And we want that to be positive, right? We're here to heal people. Yeah. (laughs) That's supposed to be the goal, helping people. It's true. I know it's it's like, it's, it's like putting all these ingredients that didn't go, go well together in a pot, right? If all these people with fear, right? Fear and uncertainty and just mm-hmm. totally unsettled. And then another group of people feeling angry and tired and, and ups, you know, resentful and, you know, stressed and overworked. It's just the worst combination, right? It's, it, it's hard to make that into, into magic. That, that's a great analogy. I love that analogy, right? Sort of, very sort of, right? Angrily throwing everything you can find into a pot. Well, this is what the recipe calls for, right? Just take a minute and say, I think maybe a little bit less salt, maybe a little yeah. more tomato, you know? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Or we have to get a different pot, right? We just have to change the whole ecosystem. I mean, yes. I think there are some things, and I don't know how you feel like, you know, I feel like even scheduling appointments can be stressful, right? And you keep hearing like, oh, I found this out and then I couldn't get an appointment. And like, I just read this book about a woman who broke her arm and she could not get in. They had, she had to fix it within three days and then she couldn't get an appointment and her she, her whole family just had to keep calling around to different orthopedists. And it's like, and that was from the ER. This is in a book called 22 by Alison Trowbridge, but this happened a while wow. ago, but, but, but it's so not unique in that it happens all the time. You hear people being like, I can't get into this doctor or that doctor. Like, anyway, I feel like some things are workarounds like ZocDoc and, you know, there are, you know, on the more online scheduling, which takes that down, but, but still even getting x-rays, even like, oh, you need an MRI, but wait, 
you might have something so terrible. Now you, now your insurance does. I mean, I don't know. I am just venting, I guess, at this point. But it's so hard. No, no, that's that's exactly right. And I recently well, was actually during the pandemic, partially tore my rotator cuff in two places, which is really oh, painful. And yeah, incapacitating. It's mostly healed now, um, which is great. But yeah, it's 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 a like it's a small thing, but it's a big deal. It sounds like you know, and maybe people listening know too. But yeah, the whole wait for an authorization and wait. Yeah. And what I would do is just call and make the appointment yep. and, and assume it would come through. But yeah, people who don't know to do that. Yeah. It's like you have this painful shoulder injury. You don't know what's wrong. I mean, I was at home, I was writing the book. What if I had to work? What if I had to do work that involved me using my shoulder, which let's be honest, most jobs are going to involve that, you know? Yeah. I mean, what am I supposed to do while I'm waiting for my diagnosis. And that it just kills me because we have this culture that's very much like, well, if you're not working, you're malingering. And yet you can't in a timely manner get the healthcare that you need that would say, no, I really shouldn't be working because my shoulders really hurt. And yeah. Yeah. It's not like people who are trying to get MRI, MRIs are like big scammers. You know right, I mean? right, like other- right. You know, there are other ways to make an extra few bucks or to steal. Like the people who they're not like, ooh, I'm going to try to get an unauthorized MRI of my left kneecap today. (laughs) So just like give the people the authorization. Why is it even required? And maybe this is that there's a need for a new insurance model. I mean, obviously there is, but you know, I mean, I know people are way smarter working on solutions, but. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. That, but that's such a that's such a great and amazing point, right? No one's like, you know what? I'm going to rip off my healthcare system. I'm going to get a colonoscopy. Right? You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Especially because you're not even... I mean, yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Right, what, are they, right. what are they protecting so hard against? All they're doing, like the cost benefit, you're stressing out 99% of the people unnecessarily. And then they come in even more stressed and then they deal with the tech who's there who's like overwhelmed. I mean, it's just like a, this like ball of, of inefficiency and, and emotional chaos. Right. And then people who just get incredibly angry because they had to wait. Yeah. Which I, I understand, but also I think that's become like a thing that people feel like they can get upset about instead of saying, why is this whole system so terrible? You know, why can't it be more respectful of me as a human being? my time just, yeah, I hear you. Such a great point, right? Nobody, right. Nobody's like, yeah, I just want to sit in an MRI machine. I really love those loud clicks and bangs. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Let me in. This is fun. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. (laughs) I'm just going to pretend my shoulder hurts. I mean, they're right. Like there's this syndrome called Munchausen where people pretend they have health issues, but it's very unusual. And most of us have better things to do with our time. So exactly. Yeah. Ridiculous. That's funny. I feel like, yeah, if I were to start my own MRI business, <laughs> yeah, right. How, how would we do it? How would we all do it differently? When did you decide to make your experience into a book? Oh, that's a really good question that I'm not sure I have a great answer to. I, I think, well, being a writer, I, I just sort of had stories in my head, but I it was probably not, it was probably at least a year or a year and a half till I was done with treatment and probably about a year, I thought, because I, I had been thinking about, okay, what's my third book going to be? And then I was diagnosed and then just couldn't figure it out. And the the my agent said, couldn't figure out this book. Sorry, I'm not being clear. And she said, you know, Teresa, you're still grappling with the dragon by which she meant you're still coming to terms yourself with everything that happened. You're not ready to write about it, which was exactly right. And she said, I don't know if you need a break or what, but then we made the decision to move sort of, we'd always lived in the same neighborhood in Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, if you move, especially because we moved across a river, it's just like, oh my God, you might as well have, you know, gone to Tibet, right? But so we we moved to a new neighborhood, we crossed a river, and uh, that was what I was focused on, right? The move and and getting us there and selling our house. And 
got into my new study in the new house and suddenly the book started to make sense. And then I was able to put it together, but I'd been, I'd sort of written pieces. So it, the whole book was like that. It, it was the most unusual writing experience where e- even though I had an, an outline, I could only write a very small amount. I could never see into what was going to come next, even though I like it was my life, right? I knew what had happened, but I couldn't see exactly how I was going to write it. It was it was just like a fog and did have definitely some anxiety. Like, what if I get to a point where I just don't see into the fog anymore? The fog clears and there's nothing there. But that didn't happen. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it but it was always that back and forth and these very short chapters that I wanted to be gem-like, not in the sense of this is amazing and beautiful, although that would be nice, but sort of refracting light and different colors and shapes and textures and, you know, different intersecting hard surfaces. And that was really my hope for the book. Yeah, I hope the next one will be a little more straightforward. Oh, yeah? What's, do you already know what it's going to be? Um, I'm thinking about writing a book about pain, which is a huge mm. topic. And I'm not sure what angle I would take with that. Sounds yeah. uplifting. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, that's the other thing. Is I write about to, agony and disaster. I Great. need to, yeah, I need to <laughs> no. find a way to, I don't know. But it's no, but it's though, good. Right? No, it, managing pain and, and being, you know, it, it's all sort of of a piece. I feel like you're trying to increase empathy among everybody for what right. people are going through. Right. How do we think about our pain? And interestingly, back when I was a PhD student in English, that was some of what I wrote about. How do people tell narratives about trauma? And this great book came out called The Body in Pain by a woman named Elaine Scarry, who was at Harvard. I think she still is. But it's a great book, but also, yeah, a hard book because she like went to the Amnesty International Archives. And I'm not going to be doing that. So <laughs> I'm going to try to find something a little bit less mired in the worst possible pain you can imagine Hmm. a little more ordinary which can still be terrible but you know what we go through right it is all of a piece yeah well now my mind is kind of spinning on like how to make this experience better because everybody has to deal with the healthcare system and I feel like even like this conversation has made me shift like how I feel about even walking into it right if I know I'm going into a fraught situation I'll have different as opposed to thinking everything's going to run smoothly Right. Like maybe we should all bring a little card or two with us for every doctor's appointment or things that we feel stressed about. And the card is something like, I know you're having a rough day and you have a thousand (gasps) patients and you don't have to pay attention to me, but I'm, you know, you're making my day by, by even thinking about my life. So thank you. I bet it would change the whole dynamic and the whole rest of their day. Wow. That is a great idea. Right? It's so yeah. cheap. I mean, you could just hand write it on a scrap of paper and put it in a... Yeah, I don't know. I think it would... I, th- I, am, I think I'm going to try it next time. If, if everybody were to do that or approach it with that attitude. Anyway. Yeah. And, that, and the one thing I really encourage people to do, and I keep intending to write something about this, but is something goes wrong and makes you feel bad or you know you feel like you weren't attended to complain but complain appropriately yeah. you know here's what happened here's how it made me feel i i do think places want that feedback yeah. but you want to make sure not to get people in trouble <laughs> right right and you and you i mean for example it, right an oncologist appointment they had me in a room where they were getting my vitals and a nurse just came, didn't knock on the door, came into the room and just stood there and didn't say anything and stared at the computer screen. And I got oh my really gosh. upset. Like, and, you know, I talked about it and they, they listened. And it seems yeah. like that's just basic manners, but sort of having an opportunity to have management remind people, yep. these are human beings. They are so vulnerable. True. Amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, Teresa, thank you so much. I feel like this has changed my life, our little brief conversation. And oh, I hope, I hope your, book, so your book will do so too. So Healing by Teresa Brown. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. 
Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thank you.